now is next mob hi turn in is finished um uh, yes chapter one we've got verses 19 and 20 to run through real quickly hi tara and uh and then we uh are going to do an introduction to chapters two and three okay this uh so-called letters to the seven churches all righty okay first of all um Sheila, would you like to pray for us? Um, I have to unmute to do that. Okay, sure. Or oh, the dogs barking? I'm sorry. No, they're quiet now, but okay. I can't guarantee they won't bark. <laughs> okay. Lord God, thank you for this day. I um, I just thank you for the the service this morning and all that we learned. It was um, such a compelling message. Uh, I just uh, thank you for. Um, sharing with us what we so desperately need in this particular time. And I thank you for the study tonight and for, um, for Mike leading it. I thank you that the um, electronics are working and that we can all come together and uh, we can learn and encourage one another and uplift one another. I just pray that as we go through this study, Lord, that, that your spirit will be on us, that we will hear your word, we will grasp your truth, that we will get encouragement and uh, comfort and um, just be convicted, Lord, to share your gospel truth even more than, than we have, because the time seems to be drawing very near, Lord. Um, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for our opportunity to get together and fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so let me start off by reading verses 9 through 20 in um, John 1. Uh, that's that's uh, the vision. Uh, and uh, we're in, we're going to finish verses 19 and 20. So I want to read that section. So John writes, Chapter 1, starting verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's the word of the Lord. 
Um, okay, and what we said was this, this vision of the glorified Christ constitute the, the official portrait of the risen Christ as the um, end time king and judge. And um, we spent lots of time going over that. But we ran out of time last week to um, look at verses 19 and 20. Uh, which are Christ's instruction about the vision. In verse 19, uh, he said, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. Uh, and this verse has been interpreted different ways. Um, one of the popular ways of interpreting this verse is to use it as an outline of revelation, treating this as um, uh, an, an eschatological program, an outline of future events. Um, and they interpret it this way, the things you have seen equals past things, that is, chapter one, they say uh, things, you ha uh, things you have seen is in chapter one. Those that are, they say, represent the present things. And they say that's the, the letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three. And then those that are to take place after this equal future things uh, which they cite as chapters 4 through 22. Um, the problem I have with that, and I'm not the only one that has a problem with that outline, is that when you read the text, you read the verse. There is nothing in the text that requires us to read it as such a strictly chronological program. Nothing like that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the letters to the seven churches include things that were current then and things that were going to be future. We'll see the same thing in the throne room vision. As a matter of fact, we'll see the same thing throughout the entire book of Revelation. So to use that as a strict chronological program and outline of revelation doesn't really fit the data. And uh, there are many uh, that uh, would agree with me. The data, what's the data? Uh, the book, the revelation, the things that are revealed in chapters um, two through 21. That's the data. Like what I said in chapter two, it contained things that were both current and for the future. But according to this strict chronological order, it was only things current. In chapter four and five, it's things current and future at that time. But according to this, it's only things future. As a matter of fact, 16 through 21, well, in particular, uh, uh, I'll say 16 through, I mean, 6 through 18, we're going to see there's things that are both past, current, and future. By that, you, uh, Mike, by that, you mean chapters, right? Chapter six, through, okay. Yes, okay. yes. All I'm saying is we'll see as we go through these chapters that there are things that, that the things mentioned, the things referred to, don't fit in this neat chronological outline. Chapter one are things past. Chapters two and three are things current. 
chapters 4 through 21 are all things future. It just doesn't fit that neatly. And so there's got to be another explanation to it. And, uh, and there's, there's several uh, um, explanations. One can be that he's just saying, he's just referring to the visions, not the events in particular. He's saying, um, write what you're seeing in this vision, write what you see in the subsequent visions. It can be as simple as that. That would still fit with verse 19. Uh, and then you wouldn't have the problem of trying to fit everything into a strict chronological program. Or I think it's better, like I say in my notes there, I think it's better to read the things that you have seen as a reference back to verse 11. Verse 11, he says, write what you see in a book. And, um, and then after John passes out, after being overwhelmed by his vision of Christ, and Christ restores him, and uh, stands him back up on his feet, then he tells him, write the things that you have seen. And I think that's a reference back to what he said in verse 11. And then he breaks that down into two things. Things that, uh, um, he, uh, those that are, the things that are, and the things that are to take place after this. That is, uh, uh, things that will take place throughout the period of time covered by John's visions without a strict chronological succession. So anyway, um, I'm just saying, when you start reading different authors and different commentators, you're going to see this very popular interpretation of fitting certain chapters of, of this verse dividing revelation up into certain sections of past events, current events, and future events. And we will see as we go through the book that it, it can't be pigeonholed that easily. Those, the things revealed in all those chapters can't be segregated that easily. Uh, and so it's better to see that he's just simply saying, um, record the things that you're, uh, that you're seeing now or record the events that are taking place now um, and record the things you're going to see afterwards, after the things that you're seeing. Uh, so does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, Sheila, one question. Okay, go ahead. Just because I'm new, can you just real quick um, tell me, not in detail, but what um, eschatological, eschatological stance you guys have? Like, ah, sure. I'm, glad you answer, I'm glad you asked that. And I explained this, this to not Sheila. Not that I know what any of me. I, I think I explained this to she. I haven't. I explained this in our very first session. I explained it to Sheila just the other day. I deliberately didn't say. And here's why. Because we're going to let. Um, two things, determine how we interpret the book as we go. And those two things are, uh, we're going to be asking, or we're going to keep asking ourselves the question, how would the first readers take this? How would it impact them? How would they interpret it? Just to give you a wild example, um, first century Christians would not interpret the locusts with tails as Black Hawk attack helicopters, okay? 
so that's what I'm talking about. Instead of in our 21st century, at our 21st century vantage point, going through all the options of what we could, of how we could interpret this symbol, we should ask the most important question is to ask what the first century readers, uh, how they would read those symbols, okay? So that's the first uh, um, item that we're going to be using to interpret uh, the book. The second thing is to keep in mind what kind of text we're dealing with. It is apocalyptic, which means it is symbolism. And Sheila's got the notes. You can go back and read uh, what I mean by apocalypse, apocalypse, apocalyptic and how we interpret that and where we get that, how that developed in the whole nine yards. But the bottom line is it means that, that he's using a lot of symbolism. What he is doing is he is bringing the spiritual realities into the forefront and the earthly physical realities are fading to the background. So we're, he's showing us what's going on from heaven's perspective rather, from that, rather than from earth's perspective. And so there's a lot of symbolism involved and there's a lot of Old Testament involved. He, I think it's 278 times he alludes to Old Testament. So um, apocalypse, apocalyptism, uh, apocalyptic and um, the uh, and Old Testament symbolism are going, we're going to use that a lot to try to figure out what uh, John is writing. So we'll look at those, uh, we'll look at that and, um, and then we'll ask ourselves, what would the first century readers, how would they be reading that? And, and how would it impact them? Then, having done that, we are in a position to figure out how this relates to us, what kind of impact it should have on us today. And then, when we get to chapter 20, in the first 10 verses, we will be in the position to say, hmm, should we be dispensational premillennialists? Should we be historic premillennialists? Should we be all millennialists? Should we be postmillennialists? But I have deliberately, and just to forewarn you, will stubbornly resist talking about that particular issue until we get to Revelation 20. I think that's a better way to approach it. Let's not talk about the systems at the outset, pick a system and try to lay it over the book. Let's go through the book and use two main issues uh, to uh, systematically interpret the book and then uh, bring up the issue of millennialism when we get to the millennium in chapter 20. So that's my answer to the question. And I hope that's not too dissatisfying. I know it may be disappointing or maybe even a little frustrating, but I really think it's important uh, that we don't prejudice ourselves, uh, Because then as we go through the book, we're always going to be trying to fit this passage into a certain pigeonhole because of the system that I'm uh, um, already leaning toward. Does that make sense? Okay, great question. Okay. Uh, Phil's saying something. You're muted, Phil. Uh, you enumerated all those and you said you had 
a favorite of those you enumerated? Did, did I interpret? Just give us a little edge on that. Did I interpret that right? Favorite of what? Well, you knew, enumerated all the approaches, but you didn't say all of the above. Oh, you mean all of the systems? Yeah, right. Dispensationalism yeah. and all that. You, and but so, you did say you had a favorite. And, and so your question is, what is it? No, I won't ask you to reveal it. I just want to know as you go through. Of this, course, do like we all, like all of us, I go into this with a lean already, with a previous right. lean. I have changed my lean, um, but uh, uh, I have a lean. But I feel the, the, the most difficult thing in interpreting the Bible is being objective. Yeah. That is the toughest uh, issue in, in uh, Bible interpretations, being objective. So we're going to go with without laying out the systems and privately uh, latching onto one, we're going to go through the book and only look at the systems when we get to chapter 20, okay? That does, that does not erase the liens that each one of us go into this study with. But uh, it, does, it does safeguard much of our discussion of the book as we go through that from trying to pigeonhole it into a, uh, to a certain way or into a certain category. So anyway, uh, great question. And now, you know, what, what I've seen reporters do to people is they keep asking the same question over and over various ways, trying to get the person that they're interviewing to slip. <laughs> so in order to, to uh, uh, forestall that, we're going to move right on to verse 20. <laughs> okay. In verse 20, Jesus says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Not much controversy um, about the seven golden lampstands. What do they signify? What does verse 20 tell us that they signify? The churches. The, churches, the seven, the, the, the churches in those seven cities. Okay. Why just seven of them? I mean, these seven are in Asia Minor, but as I've pointed out, there's church in Troas, church in Colossae, church in Hierapolis. Those are all in Asia Minor, fairly near these three. I mean, Hierapolis and Colossae is very near these three, very near Laodicea. Um, so uh, why just seven? And those churches are the main the main church, but they're the little churches that con connected to them? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, what uh, what you asked, asked if those seven churches are the main churches and that the others are um, smaller churches attached to them. Nope, that's not the answer. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to see something. We're going to return to the significance of the seven churches later when we in just a few minutes. But Dick, you shared with us before, Mike, that they, the issues in these churches were, if you superimposed them on the, on the, that part of the worldwide church network, network, these issues would be covered in them. I think that's kind of what you said. Yes, yes. Uh, but the main thing is that the word, that the number seven Oh yeah. Apocalyptic literature uh, and 
Old Testament symbolism as far as that goes too. The number seven is very symbolic. And numbers in Revelation are very symbolic. In apocalyptic literature, uh, that's one of the one of the big issues, one of the big features is they use numbers symbolically. And so seven in the Old Testament and in apocalyptic literature stands for completeness. So the seven churches stand for all of the churches. Now, and we will see in chapters two and three a confirmation of that because when he goes through the the letter, the message to each individual church, he's talking in each of those different messages, he's talking to that individual church. And yet the very last thing he says is uh, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the spirit says to Ephes uh, Ephesus, no, all the churches. So all of those letters are, all of those uh, messages are, um, are sent individually to those churches, but not privately. They're also meant for all the churches. And that uh, couples very nicely with the fact that the number seven means completeness. And so that the seven churches would represent all the churches. Okay, does that make sense? So, so Mike, uh, would, so to the seven churches, because it says like the church of Ephesus. So like what would, would other churches know about these other churches? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. okay. Yes, they would have. That's embarrassing, or I guess not. Maybe for the church. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, there's one good church out of here. I think that's. I don't know which one it was, but there's two. Oh, okay. Talk okay. about that in a minute. So okay. Those Mike would see the letters from each other that were written to each other church. Yes, Pam asked a good question. She said, "So each of those churches would see the letters." to the other churches. See, we're already in chapters two and three. And what we're going to see is, well, even if you go back to verse 11 of chapter one, he says, write these things that you see in a book and send the book to those seven churches. Uh, chapters two and three are only part of the book. So the whole book will be sent to all seven churches. Um, and so all seven churches will see all seven letters. But again, the book will be sent to all the local churches. The seven just represent the um, uh, all of the churches. So good I was question. Thinking, I was thinking today, Mike, that we... I'm reading through the accusations and then and the problems is that in my own heart and soul I better be concerned about all of them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So let's finish verse 20. Uh, and then we then I can see you guys are chomping at the bit to get into chapters two and three. So we'll we'll get into those <laughs> chapters. Let's finish verse 20. We, we talked about extensively last week uh, that the significance of Christ standing in the midst of, his, of uh, the seven churches means that Christ is present uh, amongst all his churches. But it also means since he's present, he sees everything that's going on. Everything. He doesn't miss a thing. He knows it all. Oops. But that also means he knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly how to take care of us. And that's the point. Uh, that's one of the points of the messages to the seven churches. But what about seven stars? What, do, what in the world do they signify? What is the significance 
and, and what is the significance of Christ holding them in his right hand? Let, let me just, let me take this one, okay? Um, uh, there are three categories of suggestions here. There's lots of suggestions, and they fall into three different categories, okay? First category um, is a human messenger, okay? Two main, two main views that fit in that is just a human courier, the courier that, that was uh, taking the book from John at Patmos and delivering it to those seven churches. Another popular um, suggestion is that it's a pastor in each church or the lead pastor in each church, okay? That's one category uh, of options. We'll, we'll evaluate them in just a moment, okay? That's one category. It, it refers to a human messenger, the star does. Second category might be a little bit more esoteric. Um, uh, it's one view um, is that it that the star uh, is a designation of the spiritual state or condition of the church, so that when he's addressing um, the star of the church of Ephesus, he's writing about the spiritual condition uh, of the church. A another is that it's the personification of the church. So that means he's writing to the church. Star is just personification. And they're pers he's personifying the church by a star so that we can see the stars in his right hand, okay? So those two constitute another category, okay? Like I said, those are a bit more esoteric. Then, least, but certainly not, I mean, last, but certainly not least, and not surprisingly, there is a view that see, it says that these stars are actually angels, okay? That these angels of the church are actually angels. Uh, uh, and so how do we decide between these three views? Let me just uh give you one data point that i find absolutely compelling uh and that is angelos the greek word for angel is used 75 times in the book of revelation every other use of it in the book of revelation without exception refers to actual angels, spiritual beings. So we are on the safest of grounds to say, since John in the rest of the book, every single time, he uses the word to mean actual heavenly beings. Okay? So that would eliminate um, the first two views, a human messenger or a designation of the spiritual state or personification of the identity of the church uh, and all of that. And seems to zero in on the fact that these are um, actual, real, heavenly angels. But it does create a problem for us. Uh, why in the world would John write to an angel about a local church? You do see that as maybe somewhat problematic, needing some explanation. Um, we don't know for sure because John does not share about share a bunch of information, but there's 
there's three lines of our argument here that we can see, or three examples that we can look at uh, that I think give us a good idea of why he's calling them, he's uh, referring to the angels of the churches. One, the first example is in the book of Daniel, book uh, uh, chapter 10, verses 12 through 20. And you, uh, Daniel had just prayed in chapter 9 uh, about um, Israel's deliverance from Babylonian captivity because he was reading in the book of Jeremiah and saw that the time for the captivity is just about up. So Dan, Daniel is fasting and praying. And, um, and then in chapter 10, we have this spirit being uh, in the first uh, 10 or 11 verses that comes to Daniel. And, and, uh, and then he tells Daniel in verses 12 through 20 why he was delayed in uh, giving Daniel the answer to his uh, prayer. And that is um, this angel. And from previous data in the book of Daniel, we're told that, that uh, we, we figure out that that, Daniel's pro that angel is probably Gabriel. Gabriel was delayed because he was battling the um, prince of uh, Persia. Now, he doesn't... Now... Um, in that passage, he, uh, he, well, anyway, let me just go on. He's, he's, he was battling the prince of Persia, and he says, and Michael, uh, another arch, uh, an archangel, uh, the prince of Israel, came and helped him. So he was able to come to Daniel and give Daniel his the, the God's answer to Daniel's prayer. And he says, and then after he gives the answer, he's got to go back because the Prince of Greece is coming. And uh, he's got a battle with that prince. And he's referring, he's referring to demons. And so um, we're not, that does not mean that, that, there, are, that there are territorial spirits that uh, that that um, uh, Persia or Greece or Sacramento uh, or Moscow or anything like that 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 there that there are demons that own that territory and so if God's going to get anything done they've got to battle the demons that own that territory uh, and you don't go and um, uh, cast out the demons from that territory. It's not what he's talking about. What's going on, these are, these are empire spirits. These demons are empire spirits, meaning they are demons that are trying to influence the decisions of the rulers in those countries. And Gabriel was trying to influence these rulers as well in different ways so there's a battle going on for influence over over the uh, uh, the uh, rulers and like Solomon says um, that the king's heart uh, is in in God's hand and he like he like water he directs it whether uh, whatever direction he wants. Okay. So the demons, the empire spirits are actually fighting a losing battle. God just dispensed Michael. Uh, uh, and Michael helped Gabriel, so freed Gabriel up. Uh, and um, they prevailed. I don't have time to go into all of that spiritual warfare. Um, teaching. It's fascinating, but uh, that's what's going on there. But it gives us a hint, you know, 
we're also told there that that Michael is the prince of Israel, meaning that he's identified with the protection of Israel and the welfare of Israel in some way. And we see that uh, in Daniel 10, the way that worked out is God dispensed him to uh, Babylon to um, help Gabriel with the empire spirits there, the prince of Persia, uh, so that uh, Gabriel could go minister to Daniel. We see another example uh, in Matthew 18, verse 20. Uh, uh, just real fast. Um, I did not think we're going to spend an entire session on these two verses. Uh, this, is, this is incredible. But some people last week warned me that we might. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, look at verse 20. He says, is it verse 20? 18, 20? What are you looking for? Oh, 18.10. Sorry. Matthew 18.10. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep. He says in verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus' point here isn't that that everybody has a guardian angel. But his point is that, that angels that come to the aid of these little ones see the, the face of the, are in the presence of the father. So um, the point there is that the father dispenses them whenever needed to give aid to them, to give aid to the little ones. Uh, also in, what is it, Hebrews 13, we're told that people have entertained angels unawares. It's the same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 14, um, the author of Hebrews concludes that angels are ministering spirit. Chapter 2, verse 14, not 12, but chapter 2, verse 14, he concludes that angels are ministering spirits sent out by the Father to minister to the elect. Okay, you see that? So I think what's going on here are angels. Uh, we, don't, we don't see from our earthly perspective, we don't see God dispensing angels as ministering spirits, spirits to aid his people. But now this is apocalyptic literature now. So now we're seeing it from heaven's perspective, right? And, and so now we see a reference to the fact, to the angels that God sends to give aid to his people. Does that make sense? And so the significance of him holding those angels in his right hand, remember the right hand is the hand of power. And so the significance there is, is he is holding, um, uh, he is communicating to the churches and these first century readers would definitely have picked up on it. They know that stars represent angels, heavenly beings. Um, they would have picked up on that. And they would have been very aware of how God uses angels to minister to his people. So what that would communicate to them is uh, the very aid that God sends to these churches, to these individual churches, to all the churches are uh, under God's 
sovereign, powerful control. He is in control. So that's the point there. This, this, he, the point there is that Christ, the glorified Christ, is present in the midst of all of his churches, and he is in absolute total control of all the of the things that happen to the churches and of all the aid that is rendered, all the spiritual aid, physical aid, whatever, any kind of aid that is rendered to his people. He's in charge of it. Okay. That's part of the picture that's meant to remove fear from us, to encourage us, to embolden us. Okay. So after that five minutes, we've got what, 40 to spend on chapters two? I'm joking. Uh, um, let me, we, we've got five minutes. What I want to do is I just want to read Dennis Johnson's introduction, part of his introduction to um, Revelation, to these two chapters, to these messages, to the seven churches. Um, I've, I've looked at a lot of stuff, and what I try to do is pick out some of the stuff that I think, I what I quote is some of the stuff that I think is really good and, and helpful. And I think Johnson just does a brilliant jo job in his little commentary on Revelation. Um, uh, he does a brilliant job of showing how relevant these messages are to us. Uh, and so I'm just going to, I'm going to read this at length. That'll give you a teaser for next week uh, for chapters two and three, and maybe get prime your pump. You can work through these notes and, uh, um, and all of that. So let me just read these. Uh, Johnson, by the way, he uh, is a New Testament scholar. Uh, he teaches at Westminster West down in uh, Escondido, um, uh, San Diego County. Um, and he teaches practical theology. Um, and this, this opening sounds like a guy who teaches practical theology and, and homiletics preaching. Uh, it's, I just think he does a good job, so why reinvent the wheel? Um, he writes this. West Coast churches face a variety of challenges. Their environment is anything but friendly to vibrant Christian faith. Some churches, located in self-sufficient, affluent communities, are tempted to pursue personal peace and a comfortable lifestyle, relying on the financial re their financial resources for security. Others are stained by the scandal of sexual immorality. Some are stigmatized by their community as aloof and intolerant of other viewpoints. After all, the populace and politicians of the West Coast finding it expedient to cultivate the favor of power brokers in the distant capital, show their loyalty to the system through a civil religion unencumbered by personal convictions. Some churches are experts in doctrinal precision, but amid the theological wars, they lost their capacity to care for the hurting. Others, are unclear about where to draw the line that define the essentials of the gospel as they adapt their messages to the culture in order to reach out or fit in, reach out to or fit in with non-Christians. Some churches are all image and no reality, lacking spiritual vitality despite an impressive array of activities. Others are a tiny minority struggling to hold on in the midst of a community that ignores or despises them. 
These West Coast churches sound stereotypically 21st century Californian, don't they? In fact, however, this is a sketch of the situation, strengths, and weaknesses of the West Coast churches in Asia Minor in the first century to which Jesus addressed his revelation through John. Pretty, pretty amazing, isn't it? See, uh, that's why we keep saying we need revelation now. We need to understand what revelation is all about now. So um, I will just leave that to you as the teaser for next week. Work through these notes, okay? And, uh, and we'll take up with this intro of chapters two and three. Hey, Mike. Yes, Sheila. I don't have the notes for chapter two. Oh, you didn't get my email or my text? Did you send it today? Yes. Oh, I may not have seen it. I'll okay. take a look. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I I sent those today. Real quick, Mike, do you have a good overview of church history, a book that you recommend for um, starting with the early church? Um, yes, a one-volume one. Yeah, uh, that's that's not real academic. Um, that would be Bruce Shelley's book. Trying to remember the name of it. After we finish this recording, uh, and there's time of fellowship, I'll look up and see the name of that book. Uh, uh, church history for. I can't remember. I can't remember. It's not church history for dummies. <laughs> well, I've wrote down Bruce Shelley, so I, I can probably yeah, if you go on if you go on um, uh, Amazon and just search on just church history by by Bruce Shelley. Yeah, I, I think believe S H E L L E Y. I got it. Thanks. Yeah, okay. In plain language. Plain language. There you go. Yeah. Church History in Plain Language by Bruce Shelley. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I did not get an email. Pardon? I did not get an email. Wow. Did you get my text? Ask if she has Gmail. You have no. Gmail, right? You have Gmail, right, she Sheila? Right, the Gmail. I got, I got it. Um, I got what you sent last week or the week before, but I didn't get anything today or this week. Oh, yeah, she was in a group. Okay, let's 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 finish this up real quick. Let's pray and finish up, uh, so Deepak can stop the recording. And then I've got a question to ask you, Sheila, and to everybody in general. Um, okay, um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, Ian, would you like to uh, pray for us? Close us in prayer. Sure, I can. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, two times in your word today where we could uh, be rebuked and encouraged, Lord. Pray, Father, that um, what we heard wouldn't end with our um, learning today, but would be put into um, action continually. Father, I pray for this coming week as we prepare to uh, fulfill our callings in life, that you would strengthen us, that you'd uh, keep us from temptation, that you'd give us the comfort of your spirit and a continual rejoicing in all that we have in our union with Christ. So uh, strengthen us for this week that we might glorify you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Deepak has yes. stopped the... Uh...